I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, Renee, I'm really excited about today's show. We've got Dr. John Cox. Um, Dr. Cox is a wildlife um, professor here in our department. Had a chance to work with John on a number of projects over the years. But today he's going to be talking about something that gets a lot of interest in the state. Coyotes. You know. Exactly. Yeah, so we're looking forward to having John in just a few moments. We also have Megan Bulin, who's put together a nice little presentation on a really cool little fungus you might be seeing out in the woods about this time. Um, you know, when I saw the name of it, it cracked me up. So it did me too. It, yeah, it, so it's we'll kind of a cute little a fungus. Treat for that. Yeah, and then Amari um, has prepared a really cool smaller tree um, as far as the tree of the week, and we'll save that for a little bit later. But I guess without any further ado. Yes. So, um, Dr. Cox, if you would like to uh, pull up your video. Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining the show. Hi, good morning, you guys. Thanks for being with us, John. So you're going to talk a little bit about coyotes today. Yeah, I thought we would uh, do a little roundabout, talk about one of our latest newcomers to the state, uh, in term, at least relatively speaking. Yeah. Yeah, I hear lots of talk about them across the state, so I'm sure there'll be lots of interest in your presentation, John. Okay, great. So if you want to, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. All right. All right. So good morning, folks. I'm uh, John Cox. I'm an associate professor of wildlife and conservation uh, biology here in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at UK. And I'm going to be presenting on one of the more uh, charismatic uh, into some, I would say, maybe problematic species of North America, the coyote. Um, it's often pronounced um, coyote in the Western US and coyote in other areas. So I may interchange those as we go through the presentation today. Um, this species of wild dog really is not just a survivor, but has managed to really thrive despite decades of persistent persecution in continent-wide changes in North America's ecosystems. And by just about any measure, whether that be the expansion of its range or through very prolific population growth, the coyote is certainly a unique wildlife success story that has impacted the U.S. and far beyond. Uh, and that certainly includes Kentucky in recent decades. So the coyote is a well-known animal icon. It's certainly an important cultural figure of, of the Native American peoples of Central North America. I mean, the word coyote is derived from an old Aztec word, coyote. Um, and that species was a symbol of strength and military might. And to other first peoples, the coyote was known as a creation figure, a trickster, a teacher, a helper of mankind, and, and other kind of embodied traits of, of humans. Um, early European settlers took note of the species as well, and they often refer to it as a jackal or a wolf. And those are both two uh, kinds of species that they were familiar with from their home countries. And when we get beyond those earlier explorer and, and let's say fur trapper nodes where we, we found the species called such things as prairie wolf and little wolf, brush wolf, song dog, the Spanish fox, American jackal. The, the really the earliest attempts at scientific descriptions of the species were from the Lewis and Clark expedition in the early 1800s. Uh, in 1823, Thomas Say, who kind of followed up on some of those notes from the Lewis and Clark expedition, he formally separated the coyote as a distinct species from its larger wolf cousin. And he gave it the binomial Latin name Canis latrans, and that means barking dog. So you may wonder, for example, why uh, early European explorers, especially those that came into Kentucky like Daniel Boone or Simon Kenton, why they didn't make note of the coyote. And that's because uh, the distribution of the species was largely west of the Mississippi River. So here you can see some archaeological sites where coyotes have been found, uh, you know, from 10,000 years before present up to current. And the coyote was largely associated with open areas, so grasslands, uh, xeric kind of dry communities, steppe lands, prairies, and so forth, uh, and deserts. And uh, really, so you had nobody that 
really encountered coyotes except for some of those early fur trappers and whatnot that did some of those early explorations. And so that's why we don't see it uh, in those, in those uh, descriptions by Boone and Kenton and others. Um, so really much of the Eastern US had long since been settled before Europeans began to encounter it more frequently when they moved out West. Um, now, the interesting thing about some of the distribution records of coyotes is, is that they date back to about a million years. And the coyote doesn't appear to have changed a whole lot over one million years. And that's usually a, means that that body plan and that strategy, that life history strategy is pretty successful, obviously, to have, you know, toughed it out for that long. Um, and that's including really sharing the land, you know, thousands of years ago with much, much larger carnivores like hyenas, saber-toothed cats, bears. I mean, those predators, the distribution of many prey species, all those things kind of determine the range of the coyote over all those, those different years. So the photograph that you see there on the right, that coyote sort of peeping its head up in the grasslands, that's very much where the coyote is probably most at home in terms of all the different ecosystems that now occupies. Um, so here are some images of the coyote. Uh, it has a very sort of prototypical wild dog body plan. Uh, in general, it's going to be sized somewhere between a red fox and a gray wolf, about three to four feet long, weighing on average somewhere between 15 and 45 pounds. Um, really just depends on its geographic location and the health of the individual animal. And I'll talk a little bit more about that size discrepancy there here in a minute. Uh, people um, very often will overestimate the size of coyotes. And that's because they have very long guard hair. They have a long kind of fluffy tail. So they look very bushy. Uh, and so when I talk to you know, folks out in the public, a lot of times people say, you know, oh, I, I saw like a, a hundred pound kite or something, you know, it's, but, but they look probably, you know, at least a third to half really larger than, than they are. The ones that I've captured in Kentucky on average weigh around 30 pounds. Um, most of your coyotes are gonna have a sort of, a, again, a sort of a prototypical pale edge or, or fur coat color, a mixture kind of tan, light or rufous kind of red color, salt and pepper gray on their, on their main coat, patches of white or cream on their throat and on their belly. And then their tail is usually black tipped. So on the first, on the upper left photograph with this coyote that we trapped for a research project, you can clearly see the, the, the kind of the reddish, very reddish rufous color on the top of the head. You get down in the back, you get into tan, and then you get into the sort of that salt and pepper gray. Uh, over on the right, very clear the, how the creamy white color on the chin, the throat, and on the belly kind of stands out here. And then you can see that black tip on the tail there. Right. So there's a lot of variation, but the colors are very kind of typical. And the one on the lower left is, for example, a coyote from New Mexico. And then the one on the right here is a coyote from from eastern Kentucky. So, you know, they share a lot of similarities. One of the things that you notice about the tail is that it's typically going to be curved downward or pointed downward when the coyote is moving about, whereas its larger cousin, the gray wolf, is typically more pointed out kind of in a straight direction. So it, it kind of gives the coyote a very sort of slinky, sneaky kind of appearance. And, and that kind of gives it a negative connotation. And, and maybe that's why, you know, the Native Americans, this, uh, you know, gave these attributes of it being a trickster, right? Um, anyway, the ears and the snout are much longer relative to the head size than what you would see in a wolf. So it kind of gives those ears and that nose a very pointed triangular look. And the eyes are a very rich kind of gold color here. So they're, to me, they're a very beautiful animal, although I've certainly seen my share of very um, mangy, unhealthy coyotes that uh, aren't exactly an icon of, of wild canid health. <clears throat> All right, kind of moving on here, the skull of the coyote, uh, unlike the gray wolf, is going to be long and slender, and it's going to have a lot less crushing power than the wolf. And so the teeth are, they're certainly sharp. I've been um, snapped by a couple of them. They have a, what we might think of as a very well-balanced sort of jack of all trades kind of functionality. The canines can certainly penetrate the, the, the flesh of prey, they have carnassials here in the middle of the jaw here, which are used to shear meat. 
Uh, and then in the back, they really have some, um, some very nice kind of crushing molars. And that makes them very much distinct from members of the cat family that you would see over here on the right. So that's sort of a prototypical mountain lion skull on the right. They don't have any true molars in the back of their, of their jaw here. They are high per carnivorous. So they are built to be specialists, to shear meat, and the dog family typically are gonna be much more habitat generalist and able to adapt to, to a lot more different kinds of ecosystems. So that adaptation, that, that general dentition, if you will, had just allowed the coyote to thrive in a variety of environments. We see that sort of prototypical skull pattern. We see that in the African and the Eurasian jackals. We also see that in a lot of fox species too. And that has allowed them, to, again, to thrive and to move and colonize in ways, whereas a lot of the cat members of the cat family are threatened or endangered because they are, again, they're specialists. Uh, just a couple other slides to sort of illustrate this point here. You can see the wolf and domestic dog, the, the rostrum or the nasal area is a little bit shorter. The jaw is a little bit thicker here, uh, whereas the coyote is a little long, a little more flatter, and they, that allows that coyote to be a little bit more of a generalist than the wolf is. Um, and then this is a very nice comparative slide by the Salt Lake Tribune, which shows the wolf, which is quite sizable at usually greater than 80 to 100 pounds versus a coyote, you know, somewhere around 20, 30, 40 pounds in size here. So very big difference. And again, this is nice that they point out that the ears of the wolf are much shorter and rounder, the snout shorter and rounder compared to those pointed ears and snout on a coyote. So when you do find these two species co-occurring, which they do in places like Yellowstone in Wisconsin, parts of upper Michigan, Minnesota, Alaska, then this will help you tell them apart. And typically once you see an adult wolf out in the wild, it's pretty hard to mistake a coyote for a big gray wolf. Uh, another comparative slide here too as well. This one just kind of shows where the fox ranks in terms of general size. So the coyotes a little bit, or let's say somewhere in the middle in terms of the pecking order of the North American canids. And that allows the coyote to essentially sort of rule the roost when foxes are around. They can certainly kill and displace foxes. Uh, and wolves likewise do the same when coyotes are around in many cases. All right, now let's get into the story of the coyotes. So I mentioned that um, the coyotes are an extremely adaptable species and certainly European settlement brought forth a wave of exploitation uh, for that really took its toll on many valuable fur bearing species. And that included beaver and otter mink, uh, lots of others. They were all over trapped or over hunted, deer, bison, elk, predators like bears, wolves, and cougars. These were all shot with very little regulation, if at all. And so this is where we got into to trouble in terms of their populations and their distributions. And this is where we really sort of had the age of conservation and wildlife management sort of step in to prevent the extinction of these species. We had a lot of habitat change too. We had forests that were felled, prairies plowed under as settlers colonized and developed the land. And that combination of overexploitation, the habitat loss, it really took its toll on those species and they rent regionally or locally extinct in many places around the country. And in some cases they've not recovered or they've never been reintroduced to those areas where they once occurred. Coyote didn't escape the wrath of humans during this period. Uh, there were millions of coyotes that were killed over the course of two centuries. Um, but unlike most of those other species, the coyote managed to exploit the conversion of forest into grassland habitat fragmentation. It took advantage of the loss of key, key competitors like wolves and mountain lions. So instead of declining, the species actually started to expand its range across North America beginning in the late 1800s. This is despite bounties that were put on at the local, regional, and state level, and even federal agents out hunting coyotes. It's quite amazing that, that this animal was so resilient. And so it started to push, as you can see on this range map, from its original distribution in the Great Plains and deserts to, to the Northeast, to the Northwest, up into Alaska. And by the 1990s, you had coyotes essentially in all of the continental Eastern United States. Coyotes had made their way all the way over into Nova Scotia and Southern Canada and Newfoundland. 
And now you've got coyotes that are essentially poised to cross over into South America. And it will probably happen within the next year or two if it hasn't already. There's just a very narrow little tropical forest there that's sort of acting as a bottleneck to kind of keep them in there. So as coyotes moved eastward, um, an interesting thing happened here. They hybridized with wolves, red wolves, gray wolves, the smaller of what we now know as the eastern wolf, and they hybridized with dogs. Now, normally that's a rare phenomenon as wolves typically don't tolerate smaller coyotes. They typically will kill them or displace them in some way. But as wolf numbers started to decline, as mates became increasingly scarce, those behavioral barriers broke down. And male wolves increasingly bred with female coyotes and they generated what is known today as koi wolves, right? And when coyotes moved into new areas, sometimes those males would be kind of on the leading front of that colonization. And then they had trouble finding female coyotes. And sometimes they would breed with, let's say, female dogs, and you would get what's called koi dogs. So there's a lot of mixing going on here between wild and domestic canids here. That widespread hybridization essentially means that most coyotes in the eastern U.S. today have got some wolf genes in them and vice versa. Um, so you've got southeastern Canadian wolves, you've got the endangered red wolf of the southeastern United States. All of those are carrying uh, coyote genes to some degree, right? Just a lot of mixing. And it's caused a lot of problems, especially for the recovery of the red wolf uh, in the southeastern United States. Um, anyway, coyotes in the east, uh, they tend to be a lot larger than those in the south, uh, the southwest, so about maybe a quarter to a third larger in size. And we think that's because they've picked up some of those wolf genes as they've hybridized. That's also helped them be a little bit more successful in preying on larger species like white-tailed deer. So I realize this is an old photograph. This is back in the, like, uh, um, you know, the pol Polaroid days here, but but I've got an Arizona coyote here on the left, far left. And then you see, as you move to Texas and then to Nebraska, Michigan, over to Kentucky, you can see a dramatic change in the size of those skulls. These are all adults. You get up to New York, you get to Southern Canada, and then the, the, the size of the coyote seems to kind of peak out right in there. And they, get, they can be quite large, you know, 50, 60, even 70 pound coyotes are, are, are somewhat common in those areas. And then you compare that to the smaller, what's called the Eastern wolf now, which is on the far right. And you can see that the coyote is now kind of approaching the size of that small Eastern wolf. Uh, so there's quite, quite the integration here of genetic material here, which has made this, this new ecological dynamic play out in a, in a really interesting way. Okay, so in Kentucky, the earliest reports of coyotes that I can find at least, I think came from 1953. Um, and then the observations were fairly spotty up until the 1970s, and then those started to pick up a little bit. The numbers continued to grow from that point on. Um, we don't know the exact number of coyotes in our state, but currently it appears to be quite saturated with them. Road kills are very common now. Um, and if you look at some of the quotes back in the day when Barber and Davis wrote their compendium, The Mammals of Kentucky, there was just a little footnote in the back of that book that said, the coyote is too scarce to be of any economic significance. By 1976 in Kentucky afield, uh, Chester Stevens said, well, we have a sparse population of, and they're suspected to grow a little bit here in Western Kentucky. By 1980, Coyotes, you know, we're saying basically that, hey, coyotes were just rare eight years ago, but now we think we may have a statewide distribution. I'm not so sure that that happened around 1980, but certainly by the late 1980s, early 1990s, coyotes were found practically in all Kentucky counties. Uh, we have records of those. I've measured skulls and looked at hides from, from individuals that were put into museums and collections that, that date back to those periods. By 1995, well, we're in the business of basically investigating livestock losses to coyotes because they're so abundant. Now, why did they come in and they just suddenly populated the area so quite rapidly? It may be due to the fact that at least there was a, there was a, a, a catalytic process here where the Ohio River froze over 
and coyotes managed to cross over. I think it was around 1977 or 78. We had a big blizzard and there lots of hard freezes. And we think that that's where they really kind of got a major pulse into the state. But it's not a problem for coyotes to cross rivers. Um, certainly something like the Big Sandy River between Kentucky and West Virginia uh, and other sort of narrow straits of the Ohio River, they can easily do that just like deer can. It's not that big of a deal. But if you look at the roadkill graph I've got here that takes you up to 1994, you're looking at around 400 roadkills a year. Now, those number into thousands. I mean, I probably see myself close to, you know, 100 roadkill coyotes in a year. Uh, and, you know, so very much, very abundant today. We consider, you know, the coyote to inhabit not just grasslands, but now in forests, on farms, of course. Um, they are in the Lexington and Louisville urban areas. I have personally seen them on campus. We saw one at the UK football stadium at three o'clock in the morning a couple of years ago. And I've certainly seen them in other parts of the Lexington Fayette urban uh, area, right? So we can consider the coyote today a, a naturalized carnivore species, one that we often consider a pest. And because of that pest designation, we can legally hunt or trap it within Kentucky pretty much about year round. We don't know how many coyotes we have in the state, but I would not be shocked if we have well over 100,000 uh, individuals. Right. It's plenty of prey, plenty of uh, sources of human garbage and other foods that we'll talk about that the coyote can use to sustain its populations. So the coyote is a social wild dog. Uh, I would say not quite so much as its larger cousin, um, the great wolf. Uh, really sort of the core part of the social unit of the coyote is what we would consider the, the monogamous mating pair or the hunting pair called the dyad. And the pack is typically the male and female parents plus their immediate offspring and sometimes their close kin. And that pack size is typically dictated by the prey size how, let's say how difficult it may be to pull down the, the, some of the more common prey, how heavily persecuted they are, because if they're very visible, it makes them a lot easier to persecute. And so that can drive pack size down and also interspecific competition. So for example, in the Yellowstone area, larger pack size are not necessarily good at taking down, let's say bigger prey like elk, but they are very good at defending carcasses of some of those prey items. So typically maybe four or five individuals that you might see uh, in a pack. And it looks like we have a question here in chat from uh, Charles Glover saying, are coyotes often mistaken as fox? And I would say, yes, they are often mistaken uh, for fox. Um, their, their behavior in terms of the way they move around in, the, in fields and sometimes when that grass comes way up high on them, uh, you know, people will mistake, let's say, a large fox for a coyote or a coyote for a large fox. It's very, very common. Foxes also have that, especially the red fox has got that, lo that, that long pointed nose and ears. And so, yes, they can, they can be easily confused. All right. Uh, some other notes about the sociality of coyotes. Well, they often court in midwinter and you can, you, you can hear a lot of howling going on, let's say, in December and January. Um, several males often courting a female, uh, and then they will end up kind of joining up, forming a, a pair bond, and the mating will occur often in mid-January through early February. Now, on a side note here, that's often a good time to trap coyotes if you want to, you know, remove them from your property, um, if you want to try to call them in, or let's say if you want to do a research project, like in our cases, that's typically when we try to catch them um, because they're very vulnerable uh, during the mating season. So after uh, conception, the pups are born a couple of months later, about 63 days on average for gestation. Those coyotes have got usually one or more dens. They can excavate that completely themselves, or sometimes they will use a rock crevice or other existing burrow, and they'll kind of den they'll hollow it out a little bit more and, and tailor it to their needs. Sometimes they will den in brush piles or other shelters. And that's where they're going to uh, raise those pups for a few months, right? The pups are typically about a half to one pound at birth, five to six in the litter is pretty typical. They're born, you know, a lot of your, a lot of your, your domestic dogs, their eyes are gonna be closed for those first few days. 
And then they're going to be running around in a couple of weeks uh, and certainly outside the den about six weeks. Uh, and then they're going to start engaging in play behavior. They're going to start forming social uh, dominance hierarchies. The, and, then, and during this time, uh, the female, especially during her early days, the male's going to bring back food to the den. He's going to regurgitate that food back to the pups and to the female. And then as the pups get a little bit older, the female will start venturing out and then also bring back food to the pups as well. Now, an interesting phenomenon um, is the dispersal process. So sometimes these coyotes, as they get older, they'll disperse after about six months. And you'll see them leave in, let's say, mid-fall. Um, maybe they'll wait another few months. Maybe the following spring at, at the age of one year, they'll disperse or maybe even at a year and a half or longer. Really just depends, but often during the late to mid fall or in the springtime, you will see, let's say a pulse of roadkill coyotes out there because some of these are going to, a lot of these are going to be young individuals that are moving out. They're unfamiliar with the road hazards and things, and then they get struck on roads and they end up, uh, end up dying uh, from that. Uh, I'll also say too that in terms of that monogamy, coyotes are a lot of times they're going to be monogamous for life. Although you know, in many cases, one of the partners ends up getting shot or getting predated on. And you wonder, well, what predates on coyotes? Well, cougars or mountain lions can predate on coyotes. Wolves will kill coyotes where they where they co-occur. And occasionally, a large raptor like a golden eagle can kill coyotes. They'll certainly kill pups but they have been known to kill adult uh, coyotes as well. Now, once they disperse, um, they are going to try to establish a home range, meaning they're gonna to try to find an area where they can find all the resources and then eventually sort of search for a mate and then kind of settle down. The map I wanna show you here kind of gives you an idea of how tightly um, wound together a male and female and their offspring are, right? So this is an area called Redbird Wildlife Management Area down in Clay in Leslie County. And C1 is an adult male and C4 is an adult female. And those two animals form a pair bond. So they're mates. And you can see with the overlap here, they, they basically share almost the same home range size, the same territory, if you will. And then interestingly, I ended up capturing C2, which at that time was around a six month uh, old coyote. It turned out to be uh, their male offspring, right? And he actually, for a long period of time, I followed him and he shared a lot of his parents' uh, home range, but you can also see that he kind of ventured out. He was out there kind of like staking out areas on his own, uh, you know, to try to maybe establish his own territory. Maybe he ran into other males or females or something and he got sort of, you know, knocked back from establishing in that area. But anyway, we radio called a number of, of coyotes uh, over the years down there, and we found that they typically needed about 25 square kilometers to do their business, you know, to find their food, mates, and so forth, about nine and a half square miles. And these little polygons that you see on the left show the home ranges of, of coyotes in a couple of different areas in southeast Kentucky. Now, the figure on the right is pretty neat because it shows four coyotes that we collared that were relatively young. And when I say young, I mean less than two years of age. These coyotes, it turned out, would ended up dispersing out into the landscape. And look at how far they went from where they were born. 34 kilometers, 39, 89 kilometers. And the only reason I even knew about the one that dispersed 89 kilometers and the one that dispersed a whopping 200 kilometers was because I had phone calls from hunters that ended up killing those coyotes. The one that dispersed 200 kilometers went over to the West Virginia, Virginia border off of I-77. And that was four and a half years later that I got a phone call about that coyote. So these things can move really long distances across the landscape. And, you know, trying to figure out, you know, where they can set up shop and, and, uh, and operate from. Now, so the, the average age of the, of the coyotes that we did capture was around four and a half years. And it took about almost close to two years for those animals to disperse from their, their parents' home range. So coyotes eat a wide, very wide variety of foods. Um, most of which they obtain on their own through hunting and foraging, but they often scavenge as well. 
Again, they're a habitat generalist. They're a supreme opportunist, and they can adapt to many different ecosystems and all kinds of human altered environments. In some areas, coyotes largely feed on rodents and other small to medium sized mammals like skunks, raccoons, possums, you know, armadillos if you're in, in the southeast. Well, and armadillos are in Kentucky now, so they'll start feeding on those, you know, soon enough if they're not already. But um, they'll often feed on slightly larger prey too, like deer uh, and sometimes elk, although that's a much riskier endeavor to do so. And agricultural areas, they can feed on livestock, domestic fowl, uh, carcasses of those things that are not, you know, buried. Um, they can actively kill those animals as well, you know, and that's a very common problem that we have. They also impact uh, food crops like watermelons, cantaloupes, soybeans, corn. You know, a coyote will eat just about anything it can, it can stuff in its mouth. Again, it's, uh, it's sort of a jack of all trades when it comes to its dietary patterns. Um, insects are another big favorite food. And one of the, one of the uh, let's say the best observational times I've ever had has been watched, at least in terms of coyotes, has been watching them go out and feed on grasshoppers. I watched it on surface mines in Kentucky, and I watched it out in New Mexico in some of the open grasslands. They will go out and eat some of these monster grasshoppers. And in fact, that will make up a substantial part of their diet in the late summer. In this late summer and in the fall, they'll eat berries and things like persimmon. And in these days where these coyotes have now really infiltrated and become well-established in urban areas, they eat um, house cats, they'll eat small dogs, they'll eat pet food, they'll eat garbage, uh, they'll get into bird feeders or, or other kinds of uh, wildlife, you know, troughs if they can do that, um, like deer feeders. So, you know, again, quite a, quite a diverse repertoire um, of diets. So I want to, uh, and, and let me just say what's going on here on the right here in this photograph, that is a coyote that has an elk calf that it is carrying. That, that is a photograph from, from a coyote that made a kill out in New Mexico. That calf probably weighs about as much as that coyote does, around 35 pounds probably. So, uh, you know, they do take wild ungulates, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here. But I want to share a food habit study that we did in East Kentucky a few years back. And we did this on a couple of areas. One was in a natural sort of forest in the Daniel Boone National Forest in that same red bird area. And then we compared that to an area that had been surface mined for coal and then it had been reclaimed. So we had a lot more grasslands and, and sort of uh, more of a Western US like landscape uh, as compared to let's say red bird. Now, both of these sites had just had elk released on them and so one of the things we were curious about is to whether coyotes would go in there and maybe kill elk calves or feed on an adult or, or scavenge on carcasses. You know, could we see any differences there? So what we did was we went around these areas for a couple of years and we collected these coyote scats. So we found their droppings on roads and, and whatnot. And we took those back to the lab. We sorted through those, those coyote scats. We looked at the hair under microscopes and the bones. Uh, and teeth, and we tried to determine, you know, what they were feeding on here in these dietary studies. So at Redbird, which is the national forest, we found that almost half the diet, almost half of those scats that we picked up contain either deer or elk in them, which was a lot more than expected. Uh, and then the second primary component were squirrels and chipmunks. So those were sky urids that you see there in the light blue. And then moving on, we found that rodents like mice, voles, and shrews made up about 15, 13% of their diet, a lot of plant material, then rabbits, and then skunks, uh, possums, and raccoons, and then a little bit of turkey, not much really there, and then some insects, right? Now, that's over a year and a half. That's looking at over 200 scats during that period. And that's, a, that's quite a lot, actually, for red birds. It's kind of hard to find them there. Uh, now, what happened there? Why, like, are they just out there hammering the elk and the white-tailed deer? Well, here's a big reason for why we found so much elk and deer in their diet, okay? During the deer season, so during the gun deer season here, you're going to have a lot of gut piles and carcasses that are on the ground. We saw a huge pulse in white-tailed deer during that season. That not expect, or, or that's totally expected there, right? 
And then that really just drops completely off the map until we get to the fawning season where the deer are actually putting out some fawns in the landscape. And then we see another pulse of white-tailed deer. And then that bottoms out again. And it bottoms out again until we start to see the hunting season come back in the following fall. And here again, these coyotes more than likely are feeding on um, hunter disposed remains out there, right? They are taking fawns, probably taking an occasional adult white-tailed deer, but you know, why bother when you've got so much free material out there on the landscape, right? Now, in terms of elk, what we found was that when the elk were first released in the late winter, many of them died. They, they suffered from transport-related stress, they dropped down the landscape, and those coyotes had a field day for about two or three months. They were absolutely hammering those, those elk. We found lots of uh, parts in their scats for a long period of time, and then we really didn't see any more of that until we started to get into uh, where we started to have elk hunts, and then we started to pick that up again in these areas. Now, let's look at what, what coyotes feed on on the surface mines. It's very different here. You see this open landscape, like in the photograph in the background, and here we have plant material found in half of the coyote scats. A lot of that plant material consisted of berries, pokeberries, uh, raspberries, blackberries, uh, autumn olive berries, um, various legumes and things like that. We also found a lot more rodent in the scads here than we did in the forested area. No surprise here, this is an open plains. This is kind of what a coyote you would think would be more comfortable in. And so rodents made up a little over a third of their diet. And then we, again, we found deer and elk making up almost 20% and then lots of insects. So out here in this very hot sort of dry area, lots of vegetation, you get lots of grasshoppers and we found tons and tons of grasshopper parts in the scats of these, of these coyotes and much, much less deer, or not deer, but squirrel and chipmunks. Well, because there's not as many trees out here and these coyotes have got these open plains that they can run around and they can find different foods in, right? So um, we kind of found a similar pattern in terms of deer and elk in the, in the diet of these coyotes on the surface mine. You would find like during deer season, you'd find a pulse uh, or, or during elk gun season, you'd find a pulse of material in the scats. Then you would find a pulse during the fawning in the calving season for elk and for deer when they've got the young ones on the ground. And then they would just drop off again until you had gun season and then you had more carcasses on the ground. Um, so we know that they are, you know, again, they are feeding on some live animals. And as a side note, to add to this, we've done additional studies where we've looked at the survival of white-tailed deer and elk, adults and newborns. So we're radio collaring both the adults and the newborns. And we do find occasionally that one of them is killed by, you know, a coyote. Uh, but it appears that in neither of those cases is predation really significant enough to limit population growth, especially in the case of elk. I mean, these are big, uh, these are big servants here. We're talking about an animal that weighs five and 600 pounds as an adult. And we're talking about a calf that as soon as it hits the ground, weighs on average around 35 pounds, bigger than most coyotes, right? Um, and so that's to be expected that these coyotes are gonna be opportunistic in running into some of these fawns and calves as they roam around the landscape. But compared to the predation pressure that whitetails and elk would experience, with the presence of mountain lions and the presence of wolves, it's pretty small. Uh, and this, is, this allows, particularly with elk, those populations to grow quite rapidly like they have during the elk reintroduction. Now, with that said, it doesn't mean that coyotes can't have a negative impact on white-tailed deer populations. They can, and there have been studies in some areas that have showed that they have taken quite the toll. But again, it's very, it's very local in terms of how that impact plays out just because the coyotes are so adaptable. Uh, so let's look at coyote signs and some of the, some of the things that you wanna look for if, if you want to determine if you've got coyotes present on, on your property. Um, tracks certainly are a key diagnostic. And with coyote tracks, what you typically see here is that the, the toes are going to have um, 
sort of a long elongated appearance. They're gonna be very tight. Those front two middle toes are very tight together. And you typically are going to see the claws extending out from those toe pads. Whereas if you have a member of the cat family, those, those claws are gonna be retracted 99.9% you know, .9 of the time. You're not gonna see that, right? Now, if you compare that with what you see with the dog, the dog track is typically has the toe pads are more rounded. It tends to be, the toes they tend to be more splayed out. And the overall track, if you look at sort of draw a boundary around it, it's more circular. Whereas the coyote track tends to be more oval. And coyote tracks, the way that they trot, you will often see the tracks either very close to each other or one track will be slightly on top of the other. So in this case here, you see the front track, which is a little bit larger than the rear foot here. The front track is here and the rear track has stepped on the rear, what's called the metacarpal pad and touched it. And so that one foot literally almost in front of the other kind of pattern is something that tends to be uh, very common. Now, it's true that you can easily confuse dog and coyote tracks. So, you know, there's, a, there's other evidence here that you should look for, and those include scats. Uh, so you would wanna look for the droppings of, of coyotes. Those are typically sort of a log shape. And in, in many cases, they're gonna have hair in them. They're gonna have bone fragments or teeth. They're gonna be especially twisted at the end of those, those scats. Um, and they are often deposited at trail junctions or two roads come together, high spots in roads, uh, sometimes on logs, right? Now, you can't be 100% definitively sure that that's not from a dog or from, let's say, a large fox or even from a bobcat. You'd have to do a DNA test to really kind of to get that confidence up to, you know, close to 100% on that. But again, putting all these, these different pieces of the puzzle together, you may determine that you've got coyotes. And chances are you probably do just because they're just about everywhere now. Occasionally, people will run into dens of coyotes. Um, I've seen two. They are very well hidden. Um, and they can be in the middle of a park. Uh, they could be on a campus somewhere near a railroad track where, you know, where people occur, maybe even in your backyard and you wouldn't even know it, right? So they're very clever about those dens uh, and concealing where those are. Sometimes you will see what's called uh, a scoot mark or a trail where a coyote will honker down, get down all on fours and sort of go under the fence. Uh, and it will pull the hair off, especially if you got barbed hair or barbed wire on that fence, it will pull that hair off and you can identify that as a coyote hair, right? Uh, vocalizations is a really good one because if you've got, if, you, if you're out in the woods anywhere and, and even sometimes in urban areas these days, you can hear coyotes barking, yipping, howling. That's why they're called the song dog. Uh, and they particularly do this at dawn and dusk. And sometimes they'll get each other going out there and they'll form a chorus. Uh, I've taken people, I've got a bunch of coyotes on my farm and they, they just, they kind of get going at close to dark. And, you know, it unnerves a lot of people. They, they think that these coyotes are gonna come in and like drag them out of their tent or something. But in reality, you know, they're just communicating with each other, announcing where they are. Uh, there's probably, uh, you know, some social bonding going on within uh, certain, you know, units there that, um, it makes them feel comfortable in their communication. And then, of course, if you have depredated wild or domestic animals, if you find carcasses of those, of those animals, that's, that's usually a good sign that you've got a coyote moving around in the area. And in terms of the agricultural impacts and that depredation, you know, coyotes can have a big impact. Um, they certainly have an impact on the sheep industry, probably, the, probably more so there than in any other livestock species. About 2% of all sheep losses are attributed to coyotes in the U.S. It's multi-million dollars, but certainly the impact, um, you know, cattle and domestic fowl, other kinds of livestock as well. In many cases, you will see the throat that will be bitten, uh, often will be kind of ripped out on those animals. Sometimes you'll see other kind of bite marks or puncture marks. Um, and you can call people like with USDA or Kentucky Fish and Wildlife in if the evidence is kind of clean and it's, and it's very visible there, they may be able to kind of look at the spacing between those canines and determine that, yes, it looks like this was a coyote attack or a domestic dog 
or maybe something like a bobcat, whatever. But predator control services that operate by the USDA uh, will come in. They will individually remove some of your animals for you, uh, or you can do it yourself. Uh, you can learn how to trap coyotes, or you can you can shoot them. Right now, it's legal to trap and shoot them in Kentucky pretty much year round, day or night. Um, you can you can do that uh, as long as deer or elk gun season is not open, at, at least in terms of nighttime hunting. Uh, so it's pretty much wide open. But again, you know, these we've seen for a century and a half that trapping and shooting coyotes is not going to reduce the population. Right. If anything, it makes them more wily. Uh, no pun intended there. All right. Um, so, you know, maybe it's better that we kind of learn to live with coyotes. Um, you know, they've kind of come in here to this part of the country and they partially fulfill some of the ecological uh, uh, predatory roles of extinct wolves. Now, in the majority of studies, prey species are often a lot more limited by the habitat quality and quantity than they are by predation. So, you know, I hear a lot from, from hunters that blame coyotes for everything, like coyotes, you know, cause the decline of quail, coyotes the decline of, of turkeys, and certainly they impact to some degree many of, this, of our game species. There's no question about that. But in many cases, those species are, are usually suffering from a lack of adequate amounts of habitat more than they are affected by top-down predation pressures from something like a coyote, right? Again, that's all very local in terms of the relative impact, but this is what the majority of studies typically um, show. In a lot of areas, these coyotes serve as important uh, checks on things like house cats, right? House cats are a huge problem, especially for wild birds. In fact, some people would say that, that house cats are the number one problem that have, other than habitat loss, that have contributed to the decline of many songbird species. And when you get coyotes that come into an area and they feed on things like raccoons and skunks and possums that may come in and prey on those bird nests, these coyotes are indirectly actually helping some bird species by allowing those, those eggs to hatch and those new birds to come into the population. Coyotes are really here to stay. I mean, I don't see us eliminating them anytime soon. Uh, that has proved to be futile and typically kind of a waste of money when you have things like bounties. I would say if coyotes are not problematic and they're on your property, just leave them alone. Um, if you don't and you go out and you kill them, you risk opening the door to new individuals, let's say younger males or females that may disperse and may set up shop on your property that could cause problems. And you know, maybe the best thing here to do is to deal with this in sort of a spot control manner and you deal with individuals that are causing problems through shooting or trapping in some way, you know, deal with those that are, are the, sort of the quote bad coyotes and those that are just sort of minding their own business and are not really impacting you. You might be better off just leaving those, those alone, right? And I would certainly, I would say don't use poisons those can affect other wildlife, those can get into the food chain and cause lots of problems. In places like Africa and Asia, there is a huge problem with the use of poisons to control predators and scavengers. Things like vultures are feeding on those, raptors are feeding on these carcasses, and we have many species now that are threatened or endangered because of the use of those poisons getting into those birds, right? Instead, practice good animal husbandry. If you've got cattle and sheep, use fences, use guard dogs, uh, llamas, those kinds of things, just dispose of carcasses, you know, bury those carcasses so coyotes don't get attracted to your farm and associate your farm with food and deal with problem coyotes where needed. If you encounter a coyote in the wild, don't feed it. Just don't do it. Um, as we say in the bear world, uh, a fed bear is a dead bear. And in many cases, you're, you're going to do the same thing with these coyotes. You don't want to become the, you know, the, the coyote whisperer, like you will see with a lot of these um, personalities on YouTube, where you got coyotes coming into feeders and things. Coyotes, they carry a lot of diseases. They carry parasites and they're not domestic animals. They're not friendly dogs that you can come up and pet. They will snap you. 
And if they associate you with food at some point, they may start to chase people off of picnic tables or, you know, off out of their backyard. You just don't want that, right? If the coyote comes towards you, just hold your ground. It may bark at you. It may have a den nearby. Um, you know, just keep that in mind. If you think it's going to attack you, you know, I, you can take, get a stick or something and, and, you know, try to defend yourself. But attacks uh, and certainly human deaths are extremely rare. In fact, I think there's only a couple of deaths that have been noted from coyote attacks in North America. And they are not even in the ballpark close to the number of domestic dog bites and deaths that occur in the United States. Not even close. Uh, so they're pretty shy. I can tell you in, in live capturing these animals from a research perspective, um, they are, they want to just get away from you in most cases as fast as they can. And, uh, you know, they, they don't, they don't really worry me in the least bit. All right. If you do pick up or you do see coyote scads or carcasses, be very careful handling those. Okay. Uh, this is something that we always warn our technicians and graduate students about because handling scats without thick gloves can allow parasite larvae to burrow through your skin. So coyotes, they have hookworms, tapeworms, roundworms. They have lots of ticks, fleas, mites, you know, they cause like things like mange, viruses like rabies occasionally or, or canine distemper and bacteria. All of these things uh, can be found on coyotes. So you got to be careful here. Uh, even, you know, if you go out and shoot a coyote, again, these days with all, <clears throat> with all the tick-borne illnesses that are going around um, and some of these other possible zoonotic pathogens, just be careful uh, with what you're doing out there. And so with that, um, that will wrap up my presentation and uh, I'll take any questions that you may have. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. We greatly do appreciate it. Very thorough and in-depth on the coyote, and I, I really greatly enjoyed it. And, you know, it's funny. I had a Siberian Husky one time, and somebody had called me and said, hey, I think your dog is out. And, it, and I was, looked in the backyard. I was like, no, it's not. And it turned out it was a coyote. Um, <laughs> And so that was in our neighborhood. It was, it was interesting. And then, you know, I'm in Fayette County. So it was, it was very interesting to see that. Well, you know, as much as we've seen coyotes in the Lexington area, most of the time that I've seen them has been like Masterson Station, or I've seen one like at, uh, uh, what's the name of the park? Wellington Park. I've seen yeah, that's there. Where, it's uh, a very tiny little park, right? I live right there. <laughs> oh, okay. And then, but to, but to see that one at three o'clock in the morning at the UK football stadium, I mean, it was like, are you kidding? But then again, we had a black bear right across from our building. Right. Uh, you know, a couple of years coming ago. coming to see you. <laughs> I think it was. I think it is. Yeah, it's coming to. <laughs> oh, John, that was such Wonderful. an informative talk, really. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners got a lot, our viewers got a lot out of it as well. And I think, you know, the take home message is um, really learning to live with this wildlife. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people see them and they overreact perhaps and get a little scared, you know, that maybe there's a threat to them. But I mm -hmm. think you really helped debunk a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, I can't thank you enough for that presentation. Sure. Yeah. And let me just say that, <clears throat> you know, hunting. Be going, being out, hunt, a lot of hunters will have coyotes and they will walk right by them. I've literally had them brush, brush my clothing. And it's a little unnerving, especially if you're facing away from them and you don't know what's walking up behind you. But it's amazing that how they, you know, they rely a lot on smell and they can get very close to you and still not, you know, wind you detect where you're at. And then all of a sudden, a hundred yards away, they'll, they'll detect that, hey, this, this person is behind me like a hundred yards away or whatnot, right? So, um, but yeah, it can be a little unnerving, especially when that, like if it's nighttime and you see a pair of eyes, you know, and you're just kind of walking <laughs> through the woods and Hey, yeah, I just walked up on a coyote here in the middle of the woods at five 30 in the morning, you know, getting to where I need to go. Yeah. Right. Get your um, attention real quick. Yeah. He does get your attention. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, thank you for joining us. We greatly appreciate you, uh, being on today. Yeah. yeah great segment. Really. Thank you, John. Sure. Glad yeah. to be Excellent. All right. So moving on, we have yep. our new uh, What's That Fungus? Yeah, Mega Bulum was able to put together a small segment for us on this. And unfortunately, Megan couldn't be here for some other um, obligations she had. Um, mm -hmm. But it's a really cool little fungus. So I was going to say, yeah. Renee, let's check it out. Yeah, let's check it out. 
This is Cleviuladelphus truncatus. It is a flat-topped fairy club fungus, which is probably about the coolest name you can think of for a mushroom. This little guy is a club fungus. He doesn't have any gills or pores or teeth. Rather, the spores are born on the vertical surface of the fruiting body here, uh, just straight there on, on the fruiting body without any kind of specialized structures. They are uh, orange to buff colored mushroom. They can be rather small, about an inch tall, up to several inches in height. Once in a while, people might confuse these with chanterelles if they have a broader top to them. But unlike uh, chanterelles, these guys do not have any gills or forked veins or anything going on at all. They are a lovely little mushroom that tends to grow solitary in the woods this time of year. And um, maybe if you see them down in the duff, you might notice their little, little fairiness going on. Yeah, that was very interesting. And, you know, I could see it being like a club for a little fairy. <laughs> no doubt. No, it's a good reminder. I mean, uh, thanks, Megan, for doing that. We appreciate mm -hmm. that. But if you all see anything on your woods, maybe that catches your eye or you hadn't seen before, take a picture. Most of us carry a cell phone with us all the time. So um, take a picture and let us know. Um, you can also um, send that to us on fromthewoodstoday.com and we can look for an identification for you um, and try to find the appropriate help. Definitely. And you know, um, we're Billy, we're out of time for today. So um, we just thank you for joining us. You know, the show wouldn't be a part of uh, be as big as it is without you all um, wouldn't be a show at all without you all. So we greatly appreciate you joining us each week. And if you um, want to know more, uh, you could go to from the woods today.com and all of our past shows are listed there. Um, usually within a week, we have today's show posted. Um, and so then you'll be able to watch that again, if you'd like. Yeah, no doubt. Check it out. Spread the word. Let others know about it. And um, we think there's a lot of folks out there that would enjoy a lot of these segments. So help us get the word out. Definitely. Until then, we'll see you next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. From the woods today.